Dear colleagues, dear friends, great pleasure to have you all on board, uh, talking after a long day at the ERS um, about one of the specific topics we are facing in the bronchoscopic field, the uh, solitary pulmonary nodule. It's a great pleasure that uh, Loni Amos will help me to present you what is the actual standard in our, of our doing, what we will do in the near future by using new navigation modalities to really get a better access to the smaller lesions, not only for diagnostic, but also for therapeutic options in the future. So that is the program for today. I will start with an overview why we believe in the community that we need better navigation technologies for our scopes. And then Loni will sum it up and show you how you can do it in a one-step procedure. So doing all in the first session, so one procedure, you can diagnose the patient, stage the patient, and in the future also treat the patient with the help of the Olympus technologies and also the new navigation options. And as you see here in the program later, we will have a Q&A session. So we will first have the talks, we'll go through the technologies and then afterwards, both are in real connected with you and we can really debate what are your questions, what are your commands or what are your ideas or solution how to handle patients with small nodules. So for all of us who never met me, um, I'm Felix Hirth. I'm from University of Heidelberg, being a respiratory physician, and uh, I'm able to hold the scope. So I have a little bit of idea what you should be able to do with the next generation of scopes and the newest navigation solutions. As I did that in the last 20 years, I have a couple of conflicts. Uh, you see also Olympus is written there because Olympus uh, supported me by research uh, support as well. I have got uh, honorarium for lectures for Olympus. So the question is why the hell we have to talk about solitary pulmonary nodules um, and why we will do that in the near future more often. And one of the issues is that we are running in the age of lung cancer screening. The US is ahead of us in Europe. Uh, the US have approved the lung cancer screening. Uh, Europe, this is a national debate and the different nations are on a different level. But personally for my country, I believe uh, Germany will come up uh, with a clear recommendation how and whom we should stage, uh, we should screen. Um, later we stage then in case of cancer. Um, at the end of 2021, at least at the beginning of 2022. And um, the reason why we need a lung cancer staging is seen on that slide. When you really look worldwide uh, to the situation, these are data from the US, they're always forecasting what they're expecting, what will happen in the, in, the, in the upcoming year. So you have to see that lung cancer is the second most detected cancer in males as in females. And unfortunately, it's really the killer in oncology. So most of the patients suffering on that disease are dying within a short period. And one of the main reasons you're all aware about is we are often detecting the lung cancer patient in an advanced stage and we only can keep them a couple of months or years alive, even with the newest immunotherapeutic option. So we really have to detect, develop technologies that we find lung cancer at an earlier stage and therefore the screening was developed. Um, as mentioned, the US has it, China has it as well. Uh, but all other countries, they have regional solutions, they're debating the national uh, solutions. This is from the European Lung Foundation, the actual status. So we have to be aware that wherever you are, you will be facing the problem that the lung cancer screening program will be established in your country. And then you have to deal with the 
tiny lesions you find in the peripheral part of the lung. Um, so the EIS came up with an action plan, what uh, the ERS believes that we have to do that we really can implement the uh, low dose CAT scan as a screening, screening option. You can go through the paper. I just put the reference on below. And you see, there are a lot of things we have to bring in line. There must be advocacy, there must be cost uh, calculations, and on and on. But um, as mentioned, uh, different areas are moving on forward with the plan and we will have lung cancer screening um, in the upcoming years available for our patients and we have to deal with the lesions. And that we have to, that we need a biopsy or that we have to prove what is the histology of the lesion, just uh, two uh, CAT scans from my patients, both a peripheral nodule, not even a small one, which you only uh, detect by lung cancer, even a little bit bigger already. Um, the patient with the adeno ca cancer received a cardiac CT scan, and the patient on the right side have had uh, an X-ray before he underwent a big abdominal surgeon. So this has been incidental nodules, so none of the patients have been symptomatic. And the one case is a benign disease, the other case is a malignant disease. So only looking to the CAT scans, looking if there's calcification, if it's round or if there's spiculus, is not enough. So we really need uh, tissue to establish the diagnosis to really do the proper treatment. And when you do lung cancer screening, then the lesions are also in the peripheral part of the lung. But as you've seen in that slide, and we have had a, um, an active uh, lung cancer randomized screening trial, which was finished and is also published. The data are in line with the Nelson and with the National Lung Cancer Screening Trial. Those are the lesions we are facing when we're doing lung cancer screening, so they are small. So therefore, um, we have to think how we can reach those little lesions when we really offer bronchoscopy for the diagnosis of those patients. And when you look through the last uh, larger randomized control trial, so this is the NSLT, the Nelson, our trial, the Lucy trial, and also the Italian trial. When you went through the trial, then we have to accept by lung cancer screening in a high risk population, we detecting early lung cancer, we can increase the survival rate, but we have to deal with lesions which have a mean size of 1.3 centimeter. So when we really want to be as people who are using the scope for diagnosing lesions, we have to have techniques that we can reach those little lesions. Otherwise, we do not have our space in that field. And as mentioned already, firstly, I believe we will see nodules due to screening programs, but we have more indication to offer CAT scan for the thorax. So we have the cardiac CT, where you see the, the lungs. We have endoscopic lung wall reduction programs where you detect nodules next to the emphysema. We have better endo oncological treatment. So we see also metastatic nodules from extravertic cancer. And due to the immunotherapy, we also see the second round of lung cancer. And when you go to big databases, we have to accept that only 30% um, of the patient can be up directly up front operate due to the good conditions. A lot of patients are really not operable to, through to the comorbidities. And for those, we have to establish a diagnosis and we also have to develop technologies that we can treat those lesions in the same session. And just to give you an overview, I went back to the last 100 nodules I have seen in my outpatient clinic. First of all, I did that in eight months. So you have, to, you have to accept that you see it at least every week. Um, we are in Europe, so most of the lesions have been solid. And half of the lesions are small, so you, you only offer a CAT scan as a follow-up, but also uh, a quite high pro uh, proportion of the nodules are in the size that you have to establish diagnosis. When you 
follow the guidelines and you see where the patient came from, endoscopic lung wall reduction indication for the CAT scan for patient have had a screen for lung cancer, but uh, cardiac CT survived non-small cell lung cancer. Then we have had a debate, it is CBD or is it asthma? COVID brought us nodules, ILD brought us nodules. And uh, certain patients, it was at least unclear why that patient underwent the CAT scan. Um, but also when you look to the other side, most of our patients have had a couple of comorbidities. So um, therefore, I believe when we're doing CAT scanning in those patients and we have a nodule, the majority of those patients are not surgical candidates up front, so we have to establish a diagnosis. So lessons I learned from doing more CAT scan in our lung disease or even cardiac disease patients, we're seeing already nodules even having a lung cancer screening pro program available. Because the CAT scan is more used as a technology for various lung diseases, we have to build up awareness about the solitary pulmonary nodule or the incidental pulmonary nodule. And when you really look what happens to those patients in bigger databases, 50% of the patients are completely handled different to the recommendation from the NCCC, uh, even from the European guidelines. And you always have to find the balance between benefiting and harming the patients. So this is the question. So what we really need, uh, I think a lot of uh, groups working on that, we only we need clinical better clinical risk mod models. Maybe we have to go for a biomarker that we maybe can reduce the rates who, who don't have to undergo a biopsy or follow-up uh, scans. But this is research in progress. And the more at the moment we have a couple of risk model programs which are under evaluation. All the biomarker trial and especially will, what you will see during the um, yearly meeting of the Association of Study for Lung Cancer. At the moment, the real biomarker is not existing. So we have to deal with those nodules mostly by biopsy. So what can we do? So this is from the first publication ever, trying to take out material from the peripheral part of the lung. Dr. Chuboy published that in 1967, and he published in his original article that the classical fluoroscopy guided transplant lung biopsy doesn't work in lesions which are smaller. Since that time, we have seen multiple papers, everything, everybody reported the same, smaller fluoroscopy doesn't work. Uh, Olympus is providing us thinner and thinner scopes. Um, and you see the data here from a couple of colleagues and most of the work therefore is coming from Japan. Uh, you see they're reaching the smaller lesions, but uh, even therefore you see with the smaller scope, when you do not have navigation support, the yield is dropping down. So smaller lesions with bigger working channel are helpful. But when you really want to navigate you to the peripheral part of the lung, you need the navigation support, like you need the GPS to find the address you have never been before. Yeah, even Olympus offers us uh, with their new serial scopes, really perfect solution to reach more the peripheral part of the lung. So we have the H1100, which has a distal tip now below five millimeter and a huge working channel. And it's an HDTV. Uh, image, so you really have a brilliant view to the surface of the bronchial system. And we also can go now deeper and deeper with the new SPF scope, outer diameter, three millimeter, inner diameter, 1.7. So you can bring an EBUS um, probe through. You also can bring in the cryo probe. So even with that super slim one, we can reach now with the help of Olympus, the peripheral part of the lungs. And uh, what really helps me a lot is that the uh, scope always have the rotation function. We're seeing now since the, the couple of years, we have that on the Olympus scope, which makes it especially in the epical segment better to reach every corner you want to reach. And uh, when you see where the nodules are, you know and you can imagine that we really have to move our scope uh, 
um, with the angulation options, with the rotation options in every niche we have in the lab. So, but I mentioned already we need the navigation. Otherwise, without navigation, we are a little bit lost in space. Uh, you can go in a try and error technology, uh, but maybe you will never finish your procedure. So therefore, we need navigation. And also in the navigation, we have seen a development in the last 50 years. It started with bronchoscopy under fluoroscopy control. And then the next technique who really helped us to see the peripheral lesion have been the radial ebers. Radial EBUS initially was a bigger probe, but now it's a smaller probe. It fits through, even through the ultrasound bronchoscope. So really can get that at least for confirmation where you are. And electromagnetic navigation came in, virtual bronchoscopy solutions came in. Cone beam, robotic is coming, is up front. But uh, when you really make a split between the technologies, when you move from the left to the right, it's money, 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 money. And uh, you have to find a solution in between what is covered by your health system, what is affordable, and which technique you can offer wherever you are in the world. Um, so this have been a couple of technologies. There have been data published from uh, friends uh, from the US that you can do it in a CT scanner, but it's a super high radiation load for the stuff. This is time in the in the uh, radiological lab. So my radiologist is not happy when I show up with my scope in his rooms. And he always tells me I can do that in five minutes with my needle. So therefore, maybe that is not really a solution. Uh, then the navigation support came up where you use the CAT scan to create a virtual pass. And there are different solutions available how that pass will guide you through. And now we have, so we have also Varen, which was acquired by Olympus, which gives us an online support to find our way through the peripheral part of the lungs to the lesion. And what really is uh, next to the development to those sometimes costly support is when the companies developing new toys and tools and new scopes, they always have to develop a new set of uh, biopsies or treatment tools. So it's always in parallel that you get better scopes, but you also get a set of new options of new devices, which even brought up, broaden up our field. When you look to the evidence, for sure, more money makes a higher sensitivity, but also when you look through all the different technologies, first of all, you see more, email, more, more money means you have better access to smaller lesions, but even with when you go for the robotic systems, you do not have 100% yield. And uh, therefore, I believe uh, it's not a solution of one technology. I think you have to combine the technologies. When you use uh, robotic or when you use navigation, you also you always believe on a virtual reality. The EBUS is the only technology with, which gives you a real-time signal that you have been in the at the spot. So therefore, a combination of those technologies will be what I believe will be the future, and this is something Loney will focus on more in detail. Uh, we also knowing when we look to the lesions that we have factors which you really get information up front that you maybe ask might be successful or not. We know when you have a bronchosign, it's better. For us in Europe, we have more solid lesions. For my Asian friends, they see more GGOs. So GGOs are harder to get. Uh, for sure, it's dependent, it's up or lower lobe. It's, it's sure, it's dependent, it's big or small. And we also knowing that the EBUS probe gives us a quite uh, a good hint if we reach the lesion or not. When you are able to place the probe centric, then you get normally the histology. When you are eccentric, it's dropping down. And when you do not see anything, you don't have to biopsy because you don't get a result out of that biopsy. And as mentioned, the uh, radial EBUS really offers us, therefore, a perfect solution. This is a small tumor. This is really a, one of the patients we detected by lung cancer screening. We didn't navigate it, bronchoscopy, and we, we confirmed the 
the, loca the, the localization with the EBUS probe, and then we changed the EBUS probe via the guide catheter through the forceps, and we established the technology. So therefore, EBUS, as you see here, you put it in the segments you want to move the probe forward. You, in that lesion, you can control the, you can control it under fluoroscopy. And it's super easy, even you see a snowstorm and you know you miss the lesion or you see the typical image of a solid lesion and you know you are in. As mentioned again, this is Europe because Europe have more often a solid lesion. GGOs are harder to get. So as mentioned, uh, at the moment we have navigation support, uh, we have the variant system, but there are other techniques available. And you see when you really go for the transparenchymal access, when you use the robotic system, you even can increase your yield, but you pay also that yield. And it's always the point how much you can afford and how much you get reimbursed. And all those technologies are only possible when the patient is ventilated. So you need an anesthesiologist in your room and uh, this is something you have to organize. Why I believe we need technologies um, or better solutions for the peripheral lung is, I already pointed out that we detecting nodules and we de detecting nodules quite often in a population who is not healthy. So those are not directly patients who can operate. So stereotactic radio CLP even needs a histological proof or what I believe that we will have in the near future endoscopic technologies where we can really then treat those lesions. And for sure, there are different options at the moment in different stages of the clinical trials, cryoablation, radiofrequency, vapor, just published their first results, microwaves, and sometimes you are helped the surgeons to find the little lesion when you, lose a, when you place a fiducial, or maybe you combine the technologies in hybrid turb technology. Those techniques will be more and more used in the near future when we have the clinical data out. And I just want to show you uh, the technologies most actually is used in a way that you do it percutaneous guided, but all techniques are more or less in the first in human trials. And then we will see which technology fits best for which patient. Just to show you um, what we did together with our good friends from the from Shanghai Chest Hospital, we already published a couple of uh, patients in a, in a small three. And I think this is the way how we will do that maybe in the future. You see the nodule, you plan a navigation technology, you go in the area, you see the radial ebos, you take a biopsy, you do a frozen section, you establish cancer, patient already underwent uh, PET scanning and MRI of the brain. Uh, you do the ebos for the lymph node staging with a rose. And in case it's an M0 patient, then you go in, in the same session with your radio frequency ablation probe. In that case, you ablate it and then you follow up the patient with uh, CAT scan and also maybe with PET scan. And then you really can treat patients which are non-surgical candidate endoscopically in one procedure. So this is what I hope we will see more often in the new, near future. And uh, Olympus offers therefore a, a couple of very good solutions. So therefore to summarize my talk, I think Nodules in the parallel part of the lung will be our big business in the near future. What we did in the last 50 years just using fluor isn't good enough. So we need better technologies. And for sure, we will combine navigation, real-time confirmation technology, and um, at least before we treat those patients. And I'm relatively sure with better options in our hands, we will be more um, common a player in that field that we are maybe in some institution at the moment. So nodules are a problem and we have solutions for the nodules. And therefore, I believe uh, Olympus offers you a quite good set that will guide you through that process. So that have been my thoughts about the peripheral part uh, of the lungs and how we can hit that and how we can diagnose it. And now it's a great pleasure to ask Tony Amos uh, 
to show us how he is doing that in a one shot procedure. So Loni, the stage is yours. Thank you.